Dr. Chuck the Science Schmuck. Synchronize. Now, if you're anything like me, you spend a lot of time thinking about body armor. Why do we spend so much time thinking about body armor? Because we as humans are soft, squishy, and we die easily if we get the poke. That's kind of a problem that's always historically been the case ever since, you know, people invented the ability to kill each other, which was a long time ago. Uh, probably before there were humans, there were people killing each other, but there wasn't armor because there weren't humans to invent it yet. And the biblical reference of, um... Cain picking up a jawbone and beating his brother with it pretty soon after somebody invented armor. And that got me thinking, I wonder if I could construct body armor. I mean, what's the the limits of producing armor? I mean, it's, people in the Middle Ages produced it. That's not too complicated, right? Well, in actuality, it kind of is. But in order to understand what I would need to actually do to make a any sort of armor to prevent myself from getting the poke, I first need to go over the basics of human anatomy. Not like that, because that's not really possible. As an android, I, I can't show you anything. But I did make this drawing with my new whiteboard. The uh, PVC one did not work as well, and I bought the last piece of marker board at Home Depot. I'm sure they'll get more. Hopefully. So... This is a very primitive drawing, and just going over the basics, that when you are armoring a person, you have to do, there's a lot of considerations. So for the moment, let's just consider the torso. What is in a torso? Well, it can basically be separated into two cavities, which the uppermost cavity is the thoracic, and then the actual abdominal cavity is lower, which is kind of separate. The diaphragm sits in the middle. And then there's ribs on the top and no ribs on the bottom. So here, if we look at a person, what we see is that the primary area of danger for injury is almost right exactly in the center, uh, which is called the mediastinum. The mediastinum is about right here. It's a system of tubes, and it's associated very closely with the heart. Now, people say the heart is on the left side, and a lot of people tend to think it's way over here, but no, it, it's in the middle. It's just a little bit to the left. So, I mean, on some people it's on the right, but that's called dextrocardia, and it's very rare. It's connected by a system of very large blood vessels to several um, veins and arteries. So, very simple basics of human circulation. The inferior vena cava and superior vena cava come down and meet in the middle. They enter, they exit to the lungs, come back, and then they go out through the aorta. Now, one thing people forget about the aorta or don't realize is that the aorta is, the biggest portion of the aorta is just above the heart, but that's not the only aorta. The aorta actually goes all the way down. It, it follows all the way down. It's very thick. It's like that. Just a giant tube of high-pressure blood going all the way down your body, right through the middle. And then it branches off to the femoral arteries, which... If you nick the femoral artery, you bleed out, let alone the abdominal aorta, which this is actually a, um, uh, it's one of those medical issues you hear about where somebody dies very suddenly. It's called a abdominal aortic dissection, which is basically an aneurysm of the aorta, that large portion, which causes it to suddenly burst. And if it suddenly bursts, you die, like within minutes. All your blood comes out. Of course... Armor can't really stop that, now can it, unless you were to armor the inside, which that's a little bit beyond me. I may be a doctor, but I'm not that kind of doctor, and I may not be a doctor at all. I have the coat, though. Um, so, the mediastinum is the primary area of danger of getting attacked, which it has a little bit of an advantage in that it has ribs, so it's not exactly easy for someone to run up to you with a some sort of pokey bit and stab you in the heart. It's very hard because there's a lot of hard gristle and bone. So it's not exactly easy to get the heart. But if you do, if any of this is damaged, any of the mediastinum is damaged, that is really the only truly life-threatening... I mean, any stab wound is a medical emergency. Even if it's through your hand, you're not going to die of that unless it gets infected or it was a poison blade or, I don't know, if you're hemophiliac. But if... 
you get stabbed in, like, the lung, that's bad. That's really bad, because now you have a collapsed lung. Your lung loses pressure, and it's a problem. But you can last a little bit till you get to the hospital. If you get stabbed in the mediastinum, and there's damage to one of those big blood vessels, you have no time. You're out. Because that is really the only place that somebody can stab you and get a near instant kill. I mean, you hear about it all the time in news stories. Somebody gets stabbed 30 times and survives. Because they didn't stab anything 100% critical for continued survival. Which, like, um, some people may not know this, but when you're hunting, if you're hunting a deer or something, this, it's not here on a deer, it's in the front part of the deer because they're flat, they, they bend. They're like this. But that's where you aim. Uh, the equivalent of the human chest. Anywhere else on a deer, it's just going to run away. And you don't aim for the head because the head of a deer is kind of small. You never aim for the head. You never, with a gun, even if you were, for some reason, trying to shoot a person in self-defense, of course, you would never aim for the head. They teach you very clearly, don't bother aiming for the head. You aim for the chest. With a bullet, I mean, if you hit the chest, you've hit something important, and the person will probably die. With a pistol, it's very unlikely you'll hit the head. Um, but with stab wounds, um, it's not necessarily lethal. That's just the primary area you need to protect. I also should probably make a public service announcement that uh, this is kind of obscure, but important. Maybe somebody out there. Maybe somebody out there, this will eventually save your life. I don't know. Probably not, because I highly doubt anyone will ever watch this channel. If you get stabbed anywhere in this, in the chest, in the guts, anywhere at all, the first human instinct when you see that thing sticking out, whatever it may be, is to grab it and pull it out. That's just your instinct. That is what you will think you want to do. You have to use every ounce of your willpower, every single ounce, and this is very important, every ounce, not to pull on it. Don't touch it. Don't move it. Either just sit down and wait for an ambulance, or try your best to get to safety. Don't remove it. Because, say you got stabbed with something that's the width of this pen. This is a Sharpie marker. When it hits you, it goes in. And now... There's a hole in, say, your heart, or your aorta, or your superior vena cava. Right now, that's still in there. Yes, it's leaky around the edge because it's not a perfect seal, but it's holding the blood in. If you just grab that and pull it out, you have a hole this wide, that all the blood will come out with quite a bit of force if it's, a, if it's an artery. And you will bleed to death very fast. There was recently a news article which kind of inspired me uh, to talk about this, a activist in Brazil who was trying to defend indigenous tribes was shot with an arrow because they mistook him for a hostile invader in the chest. The first thing he did was grab that arrow, yank it out, run 50 feet, and drop dead. Or the most classic case of it is, of course, Steve Irwin. Um, those of you who are very young probably don't remember Steve Irwin, which is a weird thing to say. He was very famous, and I very much enjoyed his uh, material when I was young, Crocodile Hunter and everything. He, despite fighting snakes and alligators and dangerous animals of every type, he was killed by a stingray, which is an animal so innocuous if you go to SeaWorld they let you pet them. It, they have a stinger, it's about this long, it, it's pretty long and barbed and venomous, although the venom's not lethal. He was swimming, it hit him right in the heart. He stood up, and the first thing he did was pull it out. Now, if he had left it in, he may have had 10 minutes for them to get him to a hospital or get him in an ambulance where they can maybe hook him up to some blood, and I don't know. I can't say if he would have made it or not. But think of that if you ever have a chest injury. Don't pull it out. No matter how hard your brain is telling you to pull it out, leave it in. Let the doctor pull it out. Because even if they do it in the operating room, where they have bags and bags of blood and, like, five guys who have a hundred times the schooling I've ever had, it's still a medical emergency and you still might die. If you're just in the middle of the woods and you had a crossbow accident and you've got a bolt sticking out of your chest and you just yank that out, 
you're not going to get to a hospital before all your blood is on the ground. That's just the way it goes. Now, continuing. Below the abdominal cavity, you have the stomach and the intestines, which it's bad to get stabbed in the stomach or the intestines. There's digestive fluid, there's bacteria, there's a ton of vascularization. It's called the mesentery. There's a ton of vascular structure down there. Um, you don't want to get stabbed there, but it's better than getting stabbed in the heart unless they go for the middle and hit the aorta, which is actually kind of back there. So if a normal person with a normal blade, like if, if I had a blade this long, I probably cannot stab to your aorta. It just won't work. Um, that's with regard to just the torso and the front. The other things to consider that I might cover later is that you have the femoral arteries branching off to the legs, which are huge, and also the axial nerves and arteries and veins, which go directly across the shoulder, where if that is cut, not only will you bleed to death, but there's a very large nerve associated with those that controls your entire arm. If that goes out, your arm doesn't work. Reversing the person and looking at the back, the back of a human is primarily dominated by the spine, which the spine, most people know what a spine looks like vaguely, but it's a system of vertebrae, not this many, this is much fewer than a human actually has. It's a system of vertebrae with small cartilage pieces in the middle, like a big segmented snake, which a snake is mostly spine. They're, they're like the epitome of the evolution of the spine. It's like a spine grew a head, and that's a snake, but that's not how the evolution actually happened. Now, the spine contains the spinal cord, which is a part of the central nervous system which runs from the brain downward. Uh, it's solid until probably the mid-back, and then it sort of splits into a bunch of minor nerves, or smaller nerves. They're very important, but there's many of them. It is very sensitive if it's injured. Uh, an interesting thing is that most nerves in the human body will regenerate if they're damaged. It's very slow, and they need to be close together to actually reconnect. But, like, if you were to sever a nerve in your arm, they can put that back together and you will restore some function. The spine and brain do not regenerate if they're injured. But the brain is kind of weird. It's why I don't study neuroscience at all. It's very complicated. If part of the brain is damaged and it's not hugely critical, the brain can learn to work around it. The spine cannot. It's a little bit like, I mean, the analogy that I think of is if you have, I mean, you're obviously watching this on the internet if you're watching it at all, somewhere there's a place with a bunch of servers, uh, YouTube headquarters, I guess, and there's a bunch of lines that lead that internet to your house. If part of the server system goes down, all the little guys in there scramble around and can get it up and running again, even with the damaged equipment, potentially with some loss, but not too much. But if you cut that line, every house down the line from that cable line no longer has internet. The spine is the same way. The spine has uh, nerves that come out of the joints, which control different parts of the body, both uh, afferent and motor. So your ability to move, which is outgoing data, and the ability to feel, which is ingoing data, is connected at the joints, and each joint contains a different portion. So like one of the upper joints will control parts of your arms, one of the lower joints will control your torso. Other joints down way at the bottom control like lower things. Now, can a person get sp stabbed in the spine? Yes, they can. Of course they can, you can get stabbed anywhere, but it's a lot more difficult because the spine is very well reinforced. Not only does it have these bones, but it's very full of cartilage and hard material. So unless you knew exactly what you were doing, and knew exactly where to hit with great force, you wouldn't really be able to stab someone in the back and damage their spine. You might be able to get the, s the nerves on the side, but you can't actually sever the spine reliably. Kind of one of the things about most stabbings is that they're considered a crime of passion. It's not cold, calculated, I go up to you, calculate which nerves I want to sever, and just... It doesn't work like that. People just go crazy, they build up this huge amount of rage, and they just keep stabbing randomly until you stop moving, and that usually doesn't kill a person. Well, uh, 25, 75. Also, some of the upper vertebrae are attached to ribs, which means that 
yes, you could potentially slide a very long blade back into the heart. It can happen with swords and stuff, but it's pretty well protected by the ribs. A bigger problem to the spine is a crushing blow, like a, um, a percussive blast. That could potentially cause severe damage to the spine, hence why you need back armor. Uh, there's also the kidneys, which are, you know, they're mid-back. They're about here on a person. Getting stabbed in the kidney is very bad. Not only are they highly vascularized, but they're critical for you to stay alive. If you were to lose both of them, you would die, or at the very least require a transplant. Um, so you want to keep those from getting stabbed. So, in the sense of torso body armor, what you want is something that covers the front and the back. I just spent like 15 minutes saying your armor needs to cover the front and the back. But I think I feel like I need to define what I mean by what, what, what am I actually capable of doing here. I'm not a smith. I don't have a forge. I don't have the ability to work complicated metal. I may go back on those words if I figure out how to with the stuff in my basement. But right now, I can't make a suit of armor. So the question becomes, what can I actually do? I don't think I could build something that could stop a bullet right now. Bullets are very fast. They have a lot of kinetic energy. It's not limited by the strength of your arm. It's going very quick. It's very hard to stop a bullet. And it's very hard especially to stop a rifle bullet. In fact, uh, bulletproof vests cannot stop rifle bullets. That's something people don't always realize. They're designed for pistol bullets, which are big but slow and have low kinetic energy, while rifle bullets are small and fast with much higher kinetic energy, even the smallest rifle bullet will go through a bulletproof vest. The military doesn't wear Kevlar vests, necessarily. They wear uh, usually something ceramic or potentially metal. Uh, I don't think they do metal anymore in America, but it could exist which causes its own problems. So we're just saying, what if I want something that will stop blunt force um, uh, physical attacks, as well as basic knives to the mediastinum, guts, spine, and kidneys? Well, I can't work with metal. But I've got wood. Now this wood in particular is uh, oriented strand board. I don't know how well you can actually see its texture, but it's a system of wood chips that are all glued together, which is, uh, I don't know about other countries, but in America this stuff is almost universally used in buildings to cover the outside of things. Uh, generally speaking, there are three kinds of wood product that you could potentially get to make armor out of. The first would be something like this, where it's just a piece of wood. Like they took a tree, a log, and they just cut it. It's wood as it was in the tree, straight, unconnected, and unbroken. And the second, I only have a small piece of it, is plywood, which I don't know if you can see it. I didn't turn on the schmuck vision because that thing actually gets weirdly hot, and I feel like it may be microwaving my brain. Not that it matters, because I don't think I can get too much stupider than I already am. Which you say, oh, well, you're not that stupid. Yeah, wait till later in this video. Um, but plywood is a lot bigger and flatter than normal wood can get, because it's not cutting lengthwise into a log, it's peeling the log. So they have a big blade that peels around it and cuts it off in layers, and then flattens it and glues it together to produce big sheets. The third class of wood is wood like this, where this is one type. Oriented strand board means that these are wood chips that are all kind of straight, that are flattened and connected and glued into a big old piece of uh, particle board, as opposed to uh, some particle board is just sawdust. It's really any product can be glued into a wood-like surface. This stuff is cheapest for its size and has good mechanical properties. And I didn't really feel like spending money, because money is hard to come by. It doesn't grow on trees unless you have trees that grow fruit, firewood, nuts, or leaves that you can eat. 
which there's surprisingly few trees that have leaves that you can just pull down and eat unless you're some sort of sloth or one of those monkeys with a big nose. I forget what they're called. Proboscis monkeys. They're weird looking guys. So, what I would like to do is take this piece of OSB and cut it down so that it is the shape of my torso. So, my torso is about 19 inches long from the top to the bottom. So it'll be 19 inches and then cut the corners off at that line so that it's vest shaped. Now, that's going to be very boring for you. You don't want to watch me sit here for a half hour with this, slowly cutting this giant piece of wood. It's going to be boring. So, I'm going to do a bit of a jump cut and see where that goes. I see, said the blind man as he picked up the hammer and saw. And resynchronize. Is it weird that in two separate incidences today, in two entirely different areas, I found Canadian coins? I think somebody's spying on me. Regardless, I have prepared a plate. As you can see, it's cut to be shoulder size with holes for attachment so that it can cover the front of my body. It's a little large. And I just hit the microphone with it. That's okay. Now, as I was making this, I'm thinking to myself, one, remember to wear your safety goggles. I didn't mention it before, but you should when you're using tools. Because you don't want to hurt your eye with a tool. It's not just chemicals that can hurt your eyes. The other is, did wood armor ever actually exist? Am I the first person to do this? The answer is obviously no. It probably existed at some point in history. I believe it's well understood that some individuals would use reed armor, which is reeds or sticks bundled together around them. It's kind of hard to know, because in the Middle Ages, especially, we, don't, we barely have iron suits of armor from the Middle Ages, because after a battle, people would go out and pick them up and destroy them. They'd scrap them and use the valuable metal for something else. If there was ever wood armor made, it probably did not survive very long. It's not going to survive a thousand years. So maybe it existed. Although, generally speaking, wood like this did not really exist in the Middle Ages. Flat wood would be exceedingly rare. Like a flat piece of wood this size in the Middle Ages would have to be hewn from a tree at least that wide. Which... You weren't going to waste a tree like that on armor. Generally speaking, if you were the schmuck who was wearing wooden armor, you didn't ha I hit the microphone again. Bad luck today. But anyway, if you were wearing wooden armor, you were probably some sort of not a knight, because they just bought metal armor. You might have been a peasant, but peasants weren't really allowed to have access to real wood because peasants aren't people or weren't considered, like, people. They were part of the land. They weren't allowed to touch the king's wood. It was reserved for other applications. Even in an application where a peasant would have access to wood, I highly doubt they would bother to go and mill it down into something like this that's barely going to help them that much in an actual battle. Peasants didn't generally fight in battles unless it was absolutely necessary. And usually, um, the primary armor mode in the Middle Ages was actually cloth. Um, you would wear very thick cloth, both in medieval Japan, where it was silk, or in Europe, where it would be some sort of flax or linen, I guess. Well, linen's cotton. They didn't use cotton. Some sort of fiber. Wool. Just really thick cloth. Because really thick cloth helps. It, it will stop a blunt instrument. It might slow down a spear, and it will dampen a blow from a... a thwacker. Which actually... Random trivia before I move on. Knights do wear, or did wear, thick cloth underneath their armor, because try wearing metal armor without any padding. You take a mace to the chest, you'll be rattled for weeks. Now, speaking of rattling things, I have this wooden armor plate 
It, it's just a plate. I have enough wood to make several more. But I'm curious to know if this will actually work. So, now comes the fun part of the science. I have to test it. Jump resynchronize. Now, as you can see, I've moved the table, so there's now a blank space. And I've geared up my board attached to these ropes on the ceiling, which I had previously used to try to dry clothes until I realized clothes don't dry when the humidity is about, you know, moist level. It's very damp down here, so the clothes don't actually dry. But it helps because it's springy, so this won't, you know, rebound too much. And you might notice it's connected to a soda bottle filled with water to add weight. Soda bottles filled with water are an excellent source of weight. It's actually what's holding my whiteboard in place. I thought about buying a cinder block, but why pay the money? Uh, this is easy to fill, easy to, you know, replace. I can do up to a gallon if I had milk. But that's not the point. That's not what you came here to see. Now, firstly, this requires eye protection. But to a much more substantial degree than normal eye protection. So this may have a bit of an echo with my microphone, but you'll just have to deal with it because I don't want my face to get blown off. So the first thing we want to see is can this handle a punch? Now, you may notice that I am pretty scrawny that I've never really thrown a punch at anyone or anything in my life. So I'm doing this completely wrong. My form will be completely off, and I'm not going to hit too hard because I don't want to break something. So I got my fists in these gloves so I don't get splinters. It does hurt, although being, you know, 41, at a certain age in your 30s, you get used to pain and you don't really feel it that much anymore. Yes. So I highly doubt that you'd be able to punch through it, obviously. I highly doubt that an ordinary person would punch you more than once, because if you push this full force, you'll just break your hand. The person on the other side isn't going to feel a thing. But the question becomes, well, what if they have something more than a fist? What if they've got a knife, like this knife? Can I stab it? I'd really like to. Nope. This knife barely leaves a mark. Slashing doesn't do a thing either. It does leave, you might be able to see that with the schmuck cam, pretty deep hole if you slash, but there's no way you're getting through it. Not with this. Now, I know what you're probably thinking, especially if you're from Australia. Knife? You call that a knife? Here's a knife. This is my machete. I keep it under my couch. I own a couch specifically so that I can keep it on top of this machete. It's nice and rusty. Now let's see what this does to it. Actually, not that much more than the other knife. This isn't very sharp. Ooh, it did give it a good gouge. So that actually went pretty deep. So that's a pretty bad one. That wouldn't have gone in through you, though. Let's give it another. This time with more uh, lateral force for a cutting effect. As you can see, it is gouging, but no more than you would gouge a cutting board. So not too much of an effect. This probably wouldn't go through to the person on the other side, but I really would hate to get hit with this without any armor. But as I mentioned, it's not just knives that are necessarily the problem. There's also bludgeons. This is something I built special. That tip there is actually half of a very large broken crescent wrench, or a adjustable wrench that I found on the ground. Uh, it's very heavy. I mean, this is huge, a big chunk of pointy metal. That, if it hit you, would break bone. Let's see what it does to the armor.
Hmm. It certainly left a hole, but it didn't go all the way through. Let's give him another hit, this time with full force. Give it some gusto. Oh, no. It looks like I got through. There's a hole. Oh, no. The armor's starting to wear a little thin now. Doesn't look like it can handle a strong force immediately. Let me just, uh, fix my... This does call the armor strength into question a little bit. If it can't handle that hammer, it's not going to be able to handle a direct impact very effectively from any sort of hard object. It's all spun around. Now let's make sure it's straight. Now, there is a question of, now, what would happen if you were to encounter a slightly more technologically advanced foe? Well, that's a good question. Well, that went very poorly. That knocked a hole clean through it. That would have killed you quite dead. So, whew, based on these conclusions, that armor would be effective for, um, small knives getting punched, but on exposure to any sort of heavier item, especially a heavier item with a point, like our hammer, it does not stand up. It's simply not strong enough. You would be put quite, you'd be quite dead. So, I'm going to make minor improvements to the armor, but this is the only round of testing it'll get, because I don't want to test it again. That was very stressful. And also, because it's more just a concept, the main purpose of this armor in practice is sort of just almost for show, not like you'd wear this to a renaissance fair. I mean, to put over myself when I run, for example, to add an additional weight and to provide a platform for adding additional materials. So I'm going to reassemble the desk and also make some modifications to the armor, which will be boring, just me drilling holes and making connections, and doing final assemblies, and I'll show you the end product at the end of this jump cut. And resynchronize. Now we're starting to get to a problem where I'm starting to get a little bored. This is taking way too long. Generally speaking, I don't make money on these videos. Let's hurry it up a bit. What have I done? Oh, that's something I ask myself every single day. What have I done? You're not doing real science unless you have to ask yourself that question at least three times a day. So, right here, uh, the boring part and loud part that you didn't see, these are two identical wooden plates. How do I know they're identical? Because I made them that way. I cut them to uh, these... Cutting the triangles off. These are actually little tiny... Uh, equilateral triangles. It's four inches, four inches cut diagonal. OSB is really hard to cut, or really easy to cut, which is probably why I was able to knock through it easily. I think if I used, like, a stair tread pine board, which was my original idea, it's just kind of pricey. Or, if you have the money, oak, I think it would be a lot harder to go through. But right now, we're just building a prototype. Well, you're not building it unless you're following along at home, which you probably should be. You shouldn't be. You probably can't keep up with all these jump cuts. But what I've done is I've put these together, and there's actually two pieces of sheet metal in between there that are cut to fit. And then what I did is I took a drill, which 
my eyewear is off, so let me just take out the trigger there. And I drilled holes in the appropriate locations, which will make sense in a second. Okay. Pull off the clamps. It's always good to have a few clamps around. No reason not to have some clamps. So, this is a sheet metal piece. Now you can see there are holes that match up with a set of holes in this um, in this board. There's actually two of them. So, now I have holes. Well, you can't attach something together by holes now, can you? You need little bolts. And also, these nuts. Yes, old meme is old, but I assure you when I am filming this, because I'm filming this in the past, that meme is actually quite current. Trust me on this. Now, I had originally intended to do this just on my own, in silence, sitting in the dark of night. It's not actually night right now. I had to take a nap in between uh, shooting it with, you know, something. Not actually. Um, that was... Can I say it was special effects? I guess so. But it wasn't. That and now I had to take a nap. And I slept a really long time. I don't like sleeping. That's why I drink so much coffee. It's actually gone because I drank it all. Gotta get at least, you know, around 20 cups a day. Sleeping is bad. It makes me so tired. But you didn't come here to see me complain. You came here to, um... Well, frankly, I don't know why you came here. I know why I'm here. It's because I find doing this fun. This is for my own entertainment. But why you would watch it is a little strange to me. I guess you watch it because you enjoy it. I mean, technically speaking, if a person does something, it's because they want to. That's not really true in a actual sense, but it is true in like a... a motivational sense, doing it is always better than the alternative, which is why you end up having the volition to do it. Now, as you can see, I have now bolted it in with bolts and nuts. Uh, the round side and smooth side of the OSB, you can see there's actually still the holes from where I uh, poked that. These are the outer holes. It hit this side. So the rough side is on the outside so that this smooth side would be against me. Also, the smooth side of the bolts. These sides aren't sharp, but they're, um... I mean, nobody wants bolts poking in their chest. Let me get that tight. Now, does the metal actually improve it? Well, probably marginally. This is very thin metal. I could definitely hit through this metal. Totally. You know, with these guns. Um, again, old meme is old. Really, it's for show, weight, and it'll give you a little more resistance unless you just put on a big hunk of steel, which you can. That's why I built this, is because it's adaptable. You can take any substance... I gotta bolt the other one. You can take any substance you want and bolt it onto the wood, and it'll lend its properties to it. In this case, I'm really just building it to be weighty. That is an adjective. As opposed to weightly, which is an adverb. No, that's not an adverb. It, it's like an adverb, but nobody has ever really described an action as weightly. It's like, oh yeah, he had a real weightly intervention. Guess I just made a new word. But anyway, I when I was at the store, Home Depot, I was uh, looking at tons and tons of steel, which is one of my favorite things to do, is go through Home Depot and look at all the stuff I can't afford that I want to use as projects. Which, that is my one complaint about the Home Depot, is um, it's really hard to find things in there. It's not logical where anything specific is. Like, if you go in there looking for something and you don't know where it is, like, I was thinking of another project that requires plexiglass. Where in the world are you going to find plexiglass in Home Depot? There, there's not a way to look that up. I eventually did inadvertently wander into it in the back of the store in the windows section, which I guess is kind of logical, but really not easy to find. It would be nice if stores like that had a search engine where everything was just numbered and you just said, Plexiglass, it's located in aisle 6, subsection C. 
Okay. Attached. You may also notice that because I sized it wrong, I had to clip the ends off the metal. Clipping metal is surprisingly easy with the right tool. The right tool is sheet metal shears. You should always have a pair of sheet metal shears. Like, there is no reason not to. They're like 10 to $15, and they are amazing for just about everything. They're a little bit like scissors, but they can cut through metal. Um, one of my bosses would often get uh, his credit card company would send him those weird metal credit cards, but they would send him extra, and he wanted to destroy them. He had no tool that could destroy them. Saws, scissors, nothing can cut through those metal credit cards. So I always had to lend him my shears so he could cut them up. You should really have a pair of shears. Note that I was not using the shears right now, which is why I wasn't wearing eye protection. I was just demonstrating them. I was just putting bolts in. Which, if you blind yourself putting bolts in, you probably deserved it. So now we have two plates, which are wooden, coated with metal. They're pretty heavy, but not too heavy. A front and a back. This should deflect, as we've already proven, the wood alone will deflect fists and most knives. It'll give some resistance to a bludgeoning injury, although you will still get the poke from it. And um, that alternate system that I'm not actually allowed to tell you what I did, because I think it was illegal, um, that will definitely go through. Don't do that. That's not going to be survivable. Now the question becomes, how do I turn this into a wearable object? Right now they're just plates. So first, let me put away my drill. It'd be a pain to break a drill bit by dropping it. You should always break a drill bit in your part. No, I'm joking, you shouldn't. It's, it's very annoying to break a drill bit, especially when you need a very specific size. Disconnect the battery when storing a drill. I do have a corded drill. I just generally only use the corded drill when I really, really need to drill. Like when you get that drill and urge, and you're just like, I gotta drill. Everybody gets that, eventually. If you haven't got it yet, it's because you're young, and you will, by the time you hit 39, just get the urge to drill everything. Like a bee. That makes sense if you're familiar with wood-boring bees, which are very common around here. We don't like honeybees. We like the kind of bees that for wood and just, well, opposite. We like honeybees. I don't like honeybees very much. They're an invasive species. Great, now all the bee people are going to attack me, but you know it's true. They're, they're not supposed to be here. Solitary bees and bumblebees are, I much prefer bumblebees. Okay, I'm using this as a measurement because most of what I do is based on guesses, so these blue parts here, because I didn't shave off the blue. Shave off the blue. Sounds almost poetic. I That's where your head goes. So I need to connect these by a system of straps. I didn't buy... Do I have any? I have a lot of stuff hanging from the ceiling because I have a lot of rafters. It's an unfinished basement. I don't have any like real good rope. Which, it's ominous to have real good rope hanging from the ceiling. I do have this string. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but I've noticed this. I guess it's what you young people would call a gripe. It's really, really, really hard to find string. Where do you even buy string? Like, there's no string store. I don't even think the fabric store sells anything except thread. Like, actual string. You have to either get it off of Amazon or hunt it. Like, it is not easy to find. Now, this is... um. It's actually twine. It's hemp. Which makes me wonder a little bit if you could smoke it, but I don't really want to try because um, my lungs are actually already kind of bad. I've had pneumonia so many times, they're kind of messed up. How do you get pneumonia in this day and age? I have no idea, but I managed to pull it off. So, how do I want to go about doing this? These particular lengths of string aren't quite long enough to reach the other side of the uh, the assembly. So I'm just going to tie it off with one go-round. Just for demonstration purposes, if that's not enough, I can always go back and add another loop of string. 
No, knots are not my forte. Ha ha ha. Uh, I was not a Boy Scout. I think I was a Cub Scout? I barely remember it. But... Yeah, I was. I never really was good at knots. Cub Scouts is a little bit like... Hmm. Nope, I don't want to say anything about the cu anything bad about the Cub Scouts. That was incredibly fun, and I very much enjoyed it. It helped me get a better appreciation for nature. I, I was actually in it in Vermont, which is probably so far my favorite place to live. I used to live in Vermont before I lived in New York. Um, and it is my hope that eventually I can afford to go back there and just spend the rest of my life there. I highly doubt I will ever have enough money to do that, though. Ooh, this string's somewhat longer. You say to yourself, how expensive is it to live in Vermont? It's not a matter of expense. It's a matter of... Um, can I get a, a stable job there? And the answer is no. But if I could... Like, I never really understand... Eh, I guess every person... I What's the phrase? To each his own. I never really understand when people are like, Oh, I'm just going to go move to L.A. It's like, are you going to take a drill to your knee? Like, why would you do that? For me, it's you gotta go to a, a small town with real dirt roads and forest. I can have goats and chickens and some sort of dog. I'm never gonna have a dog in real life unless I move to a rural location. So this is asymmetrical. And all my string pieces are too short. You ask why I had this uh, prototyping. But, you're only interested really in the demonstration here. So, this is roughly what the armor would look like just standing. Your head goes through the hole. So this one's the front. I'm actually going to need to take this headphone off. Okay. So. Yes. This probably looks very, very bad. But I think it is relatively effective. I mean, that's, you know, my chest and my back are now covered in metal and wood. Um, if I wanted to have this more stable for running, there are sub-holes here on the sides, which I could thread another piece of twine or shoelace through and just, you know, tie it like you would tie your shoes. My original intention was to have pieces on the side because someone can go around the side, but it's not really practical to get into and out of. It probably also needs better reinforcement on the shoulders because that will hurt over time. And sitting down with it, you do have to watch your chin. I mean, is this effective armor? Well, We've already proven it's relatively effective. I think I could probably put a coat over this and walk around with it, and I don't think people would notice. And it would make me pretty resistant to shankage into mean, my mediastinum and my guts. Not if they hit me with something, but I think I'd do better than if I was hit without it. It might go through and poke me, but I don't think it's going to break a bone as reliably. It's not very heavy. I mean, it does, it's sticking out right now because I didn't size the neck 100% right, and it's not compressed. So, yeah, I think that is a success. I mean, it's not a stunning success. I didn't die. I mean, it did fairly productive. I didn't die, but I didn't hide it. I didn't hide it, but I had to dig. I said it folds up nicely. You probably didn't hear it, because the only way you can hear me is through this thing, because I bought a potato instead of a camera. So, yes. The body armor does seem to function. Let's go over the conclusions of what I... It does function against punching and most knives. A pointy hammer will blast through it. And any sort of projectile will very easily go through it. 
The metal probably gives it a little bit more resistance, but I don't, I'm not going to go through that whole process again just to destroy my $7 pieces of metal. Generally speaking, it's more for weight or for just limited reinforcement. If you wanted to make this more sturdy, you would need to use better quality wood, like a solid piece of oak or pine, oak being harder. And instead of using thin sheet metal, you would probably reinforce it with very thick metal, uh, especially like a big old chunk of AR steel, although you should note that you would not want to be in it being shot, because if this were bulletproof steel, bullets don't stop when they hit the steel. They It's called spalling. They go, and you would get covered in shrapnel and probably lose your chin. So don't try to make this bulletproof. That's something that I have to say, is you can build this at home. Most of my experiments you can try at home. I'll let you know if you can't. The only thing being, be careful with the testing. Don't do anything stupid. Don't fire a gun indoors. Um, and you're not going to be able to make it bulletproof successfully. Also, don't test it on a person unless that's... No, just don't. Don't put something like this on a person and try to test it. I don't have a co-host. I probably would have done that if I had a co-host. But you definitely shouldn't. Remember, I'm not alive, so I can't die. But I really would not want to go to the hospital saying, yeah, I was testing OSB body armor, and a guy hit me in the face with a, ha a hammer because he missed the armor. And definitely don't test body armor with a person in it with a gun. There's a reason I don't work with guns down here. It's because I don't have a range necessary to operate them safely. So don't trust something like this to stop bullets. Don't even trust a bulletproof vest to stop bullets. It is only for if everything has gone absolutely wrong, maybe you will survive. It's not meant to just be, oh yeah, I'm just going to take bullets. Don't. Don't do that. Don't be stupid. Which... I suppose is the thought that I will leave you on. It was probably the most important advice that I was ever given. It was during school uh, when I was on the cross-country team. I was not good at it, so don't think I was very good. I was very slow. Coach Lowndes said to me, don't do stupid things. That was our one team rule. So, don't do stupid things. Remember that when you're sciencing, and remember to science every day. Thank you for watching. You don't need to hit like and subscribe because it doesn't actually matter. I'm not monetized currently anyway. So, goodbye. Extra.